As you know, the government is in the midst of yet another curriculum review. I'm sure you'll share my confidence that this time they'll get it right. We have two interesting speakers here today who have their views about the future of the curriculum. Uh, Rod Bristow is uh, president of uh, Pearson UK, and he will talk in a minute about the key skills that youngsters will need for the 21st century. David Aronovich, uh, the Times columnist and broadcaster, has a particular take on how we should look at the curriculum in a fresh way. Education is more important today than it's ever been. Employers are asking people to be ever better qualified. The demand for ever better education, more meaningful qualifications, higher standards is most emphatically not driven by government, but rather it's the reverse. The reason government is placing education high up on its agenda is because of its growing importance in the public, public consciousness. And that's why so many kids want to go to university, despite huge increases in fees. It's a global phenomenon that people want to be better, ever better educated. And the Secretary of State has said he wants policy to be based on evidence rather than ideology, because he believes it's the ideologues that have let the system down. Um, and he would say that it's more evidence and less ideology, and that sounds like a pretty good idea to me. I just hope that's actually what we do. Um, I don't think that we or government or anyone's really found uh, a perfect answer to the question of really what matters, but we actually do have a view on what education's for. Um, and simply put, um, it's what the customer, the child, the student, the learner wants. What they want, what their parents want, is to have the knowledge and the confidence that goes with it to be able to help make progress in their life. It's a pretty simple idea. Of course, doing it isn't simple because there are so many ways that people can make that progress and there are so many kinds of learners. And that means that our education system has to offer choices that enable students to learn in ways that are personal to them. So what are the skills that people are going to need in the 21st century? And indeed, do they need skills? Or actually, isn't it that they need knowledge and facts? Which sort of leads on to this idea of what is the difference between knowledge and skills. We've arrived at some sort of artificial divide between knowledge and skills, with the implicit but slightly odd notion that skills don't involve knowledge. And there is a public perception that in education academic study, is more demanding somehow than just being practical. So why is it that we always end up dividing education between academic and practical, with the former traditionally, typically perhaps, carrying a slightly higher status than, than the latter? And the American philosopher and author Matthew Crawford um, speculated that perhaps one of the reasons for that is to do with the rise of management science at the beginning of the last century, when the world got divided up uh, between the managers uh, who made the decisions based on thought and the workers who did what they were asked to do by the managers without having to think about it at all. Of course, the managers were the ones that would ed be educated. The workers didn't need to be educated in the same way. Of course, that model doesn't work today. I mean, repetitive jobs can be automated, and if they can't be automated, they can be outsourced. And the sort of decision science that was popular at the beginning of the 19th century has been modified. And it's more likely now than it's ever been that managers are really going to be expected to have the ability to do stuff, not only to know stuff. But have our values in education caught up with that modern reality? The progress that we've made in education in this country is incredible. The energy uh, that's put into teaching now is far greater than when I was at school. But we have got this proposal for an English baccalaureate out there on the table, which, of course, is the maths, English, sciences, uh, humanity, and a modern or an ancient uh, language. And that sets out the aspiration that every uh, young person should study a core uh, of, of traditional academic subjects. Of course, academic excellence is certainly recognized by our top universities and employers. It sounds good. Um, top, top grades in these subjects really count, and for many people they are a really great pathway for progression to some of the excellent universities. But actually, there are some problems with the English baccalaureate. Um, first, you can get one no matter what your grades are, uh, as long as they're between A to C. Second, um, while the grade C that you get in Latin, or maybe even Biblical Hebrew, 
will count towards your English baccalaureate. Um, your grade A star in engineering or IT or music doesn't. And, and so universities recognize this, and they are telling us, including the University of Oxford and Cambridge, that the English baccalaureate will not be a measure that they take into account when selecting students. And teachers sense this, and large numbers of them are telling us that they think the English baccalaureate won't help most of their students to progress. The government, though, has taken quite a big step to help the English baccalaureate take off, because it is now a key measure in school league tables. So maybe the English baccalaureate will take off. Um, it's not known. But perhaps if it does, one of the reasons it will will be more because of what's happening with school league tables than because of any evidence that it's going to support progression. And I think the idea behind it is good, is sound. But on its own, uh, the way it's been configured may not help fully equip uh, young people for the future. And teachers are telling us they'd like to celebrate a more diverse and integrated set of qualifications that combine academic and practical learning. And such an education must retain an academic core, let's say English, maths and science, but, but would give people more room to, to diversify, to study rigorous practical subjects like engineering, construction, ICT, music uh, or business, for example. So perhaps the right path um, isn't the academic route alone um, or the practical route alone. Maybe the best path offers a combination of both academic knowledge and practical know-how. And if we accept young people need to learn in a variety of ways, then what's the best way to forge that combination for them? And who on earth could we trust with such a, a colossal uh, responsibility? We need to forge a different set of alliances to move away from the idea that our job as an awarding body is to comply with a micromanaging regulator, but more to engage deeply with the needs of universities and employers when setting out our new programs of learning and the standards that they represent. In conclusion, I do like a lot of what the government's doing. I admire the aspiration. I think schools with more autonomy are more likely to succeed. I think that raising the status of teachers and giving them more power will continue to make a big difference. My main concern is that good, rigorous and inspiring subjects may be squeezed out by the English baccalaureate and that may limit choice for, and progress for many. And perhaps the most succinct way that I can put it is that in the 21st century, we're going to need thinkers who can act and practitioners who can think. And I hope that all of us involved in teaching and, and learning can make ourselves as flexible in how um, and what we offer young people to prepare them for what is a very exciting but evolving world. It's all about teachers. Look at Finland. It's all about structure. Look at Sweden. It's all about curriculum. Look at Singapore. We need a national curriculum to be very specific because we've fallen so far behind Germany. We need teacher autonomy because teachers have to have complete freedom to teach what they want, otherwise they won't be able to function and they will wither and die and commit suicide. We need teacher autonomy, but they must teach the English back and they must teach it in this way. And so, like everybody else or a lot of other people, I've changed my mind here and there and back again, uh, impressed always by the degree of certainty which people have brought to this discussion that they have discovered the way in which we could make things better. I have two general observations to make, I think, in advance of your uh, discussions today, all of which, all of your discussions involving you, will be more expert than anything that I have to say. And let me just preface it by, an, by uh, an illustration of what you might describe as the national press conversation about uh, education. Uh, the independent newspapers top education stories this morning by the number read on its website. Number one, weird and wonderful university courses. Two, why the head teachers union leader opposes the government's free schools policy. Three, would-be state school teachers to be trained in independent schools. Four, the complete university guide, top ten universities. Five, Gaddafi's son's LSE thesis written by Libyan academic. Six, 
Fury at Amani Sultan's Cash for Cambridge. Seven, which is the best university for sport? Eight, secondary school league tables, the top 50 independent schools at A-level. Nine, the top 100 grammar schools. Ten, Russell Group universities shun soft subjects. Eleven, it was all easy. Teenage genius takes 23 A-levels in a single year. <laughs> 12, the complete university guide, new institutions challenge the old guard's dominance. 13, secondary school league tables, the top 50 grammar schools at A-level. 14, boarding school is a form of child abuse, says psychotherapist. <laughs> and 15, secondary school tables, top 200 state comprehensive schools at A-level. You had to get to number 15 before you got anywhere close to the educational experience of even a small fraction of our children. But that was what the reader's preferences on the Independence website. Um, so, theme number one, the tiger. The tone of our discussions that reflect current fears, I call this, based, of course, on the battle hymn of the tiger mother. Amy Chua, this uh, American professor from a uh, Chinese-American background, wrote in this book, Lulu handed me her surprise, which turned out to be a card, she wrote. More accurately, it was a piece of paper folded crookedly in half with a big happy face on the front. Inside, happy birthday, mummy, love Lulu, was scrawled in crayon above another happy face. I gave the card back to Lulu. I don't want this, I said. I want a better one, one that you've put some thought and effort into. I have a special box where I keep all my cards from you and Sophia, and this one can't go in there. I grabbed the card again and flipped it over. I pulled out a pen and scrawled, Happy birthday, Lulu. Whoopee. I added a big sour face. I reject this. Um, now, what kind of mother throws her four-year-old daughter's homemade birthday cards back at them? Uh, and what Chua says is a Chinese one. <laughs> Since then, Chua has said that a lot of what she wrote in that book was a confessional rather than a manual, that it was tongue-in-cheek, or at least a little bit in cheek, and that she wasn't responsible for the headline over the article which was uh, promoting the book, Why Chinese Mothers Are Superior. But this is what she actually did write in this. A lot of people wonder how Chinese parents raise such stereotypically successful kids. They wonder what these parents do to produce so many math whizzes and music prodigies, what it's like inside the family and whether they could do it too. Well, I can tell them because I've done it. Here are some things that my daughter, Sophia and Louisa, were never allowed to do. Attend a sleepover have a play date, be in a school play, complain about not being in a school play, watch TV or play computer games, choose their own extracurricular activities, get any grade less than an A, not be the number one student in every subject except gym and drama, play any instrument other than the piano or violin. She says, to get good at anything, you have to work, and children on their own never want to work, which is why it's crucial to override their preferences. This often requires fortitude on the part of the parents because the child will resist. Things are always hardest at the beginning. Tenacious practice, practice, practice is crucial for excellence. Rote repetition is underrated in America. But the Wall Street Journal held a poll at the end of this particular article, and 35,738 people voted. Which style of parenting is best for children, they were asked. Permissive Western style, PWS, or demanding Eastern parenting, DEP? 38% went for permissive Western style. 62%, given what I've just read out to you, voted for demanding Eastern parenting. This begins to tell you something. It all begins to add up. That's in the level of discussion about it. We are familiar with it. What are we going to do to be up there with the Singapores, the Shanghais, the Seoul's, and the Hong Kongs. And this is where we begin, begun in the last few years to get this discussion back about learning by rote, about all class and blackboard, blackboard pedagogy, the constant fear and reinvoking for, for, for kids the constant fear of failure, a return, if you like, to what we might regard as ancient pedagogical values. And it absolutely seeps everywhere into a particular kind of public discussion. So now we come to our second theme, which is 
the uh, Wolf, Professor Alison Wolf, whose report on vocational education, should we care how two-thirds of English young people are educated? She says it sounds like a stupid question, but look at what we offer teenage students, and it seems obvious that, in fact, our elite has not been bothered. Uh, as you know, for those of you who haven't studied the Wolf Report, you should. It's quite a remarkable performance. But the thing that is most remarkable about it is that it has to be said at all. I mean, she does, for instance, recommend the highest qualification, the BTEC. I have to tell you, I would reckon that half my colleagues at the Times, and the same would be true of the Guardian elsewhere, do not know what a BTEC is. They don't have children that ever even take the BTEC, let alone other vocational qualifications. They have never heard of them. They don't go to the sort of schools or to the sorts of classes where these things are taught. Now, she says, Wolf, vocational education has been distorted by a particularly strange case of English exceptionalism. And we know what it is. We have been discussing this for 50 years now, which was about the English tendency towards over-specialisation, which incidentally does not begin with... Um, uh, employer's demands, as Wolf seems to think it does, but it actually begins with the demands of the three-year university course as well. That's, where it, all that's wh where it all came up. And the only reason, in my opinion, why schools like the independent schools have become in interested in their own version of the baccalaureate is not because they have a fundamental objection to over-specialisation. It is because other kids have got so good at the A-levels that they're seeking for something to distinguish themselves always and their own pupils from what it is that the hoi polloi are doing because that is part of how they achieve their competitive advantage. If what we are saying is that over-specialisation is a problem, it also kind of follows that, in a sense, the notion in quite a lot of subjects, that it is, say, say in history, the knowledge of the event itself, let's say, or the specificity of the thing itself that is all important, must, must be overridden by the idea that there are themes and skills in those subjects which are often more important. And that is the putting together on the posse and having the range of those skills and themes, that is the ability to in, in exercise a critical faculty towards the world around you as it is, not as somebody imagines it should be, was, etc., but as it is. Um, now, I therefore have a kind of one overriding um, suggestion for people involved in mainstream education. Now, if you can't force it into elite national conversation with policymakers, it is always going to fall short. And why? Because by and large, these other people, this majority of people, don't exercise their voices in the same way. Far from demanding too much, our young people, most of our young people, as we know, and a lot of our population, they demand too little, and you have to demand on their behalf.